Uh, it's that time of uh, week, month? No, that doesn't sound right either. This is James Moore. You're listening to Solar Powered Crew FM. That music means it's time for city business. That means we're going to catch you up on what's the latest haps at City Hall. We have with us a city councilman, Michael Halley of the 4th Ward, who is uh, kind enough to uh, give us the latest of each uh, city council meeting. We do appreciate that. And also... Uh, it's a bit of a rainy day as we're speaking live right now. FMC, Fairfield Media Center, in the house. We appreciate Jason and the good folks there dropping by. We hear there's going to be some live coverage of the uh, Fairfest 14 that's coming up, and we're pretty excited about all that. So let's uh, get straight to it. You can catch City Business News uh, lunchtimes, Tuesdays, 1230, Thursday dinner time at 630, and the following Monday at breakfast time, 6.30 a.m., so you get to choose when you want to uh, sit and digest this information. Speaking of digesting, looks like we got, we got like, goodies and little, like, uh, trinkets and all kinds of stuff uh, here. You almost think this is like TV, but uh, anyway, Michael Halley, good to see you. How are you doing today? I'm good. Glad to be here, as always. I appreciate you dropping by, and I know there's a bunch to cover. It looked like a pretty interesting meeting. Well, it was a one-page agenda, which uh, the council always likes. We got done in about 45 minutes. Uh, short, but sweet. Yeah. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it up a little. I think in the past, I've tended to read almost every item that's on here, and some of it is really very mundane. And uh, This is all available for the public if you want to see our agenda. It's posted at City Hall on the window prior to the meeting. It's also available on the city's website, cityoffairfieldiowa.com, on the uh, City of Fairfield Government Facebook page, and um, in the Fairfield Ledger. So really it's uh, it's quite available, but you know, we're gonna highlight the highlights because I wanna make sure people hear more about the things that would probably be of interest to them. Great. Maybe not so much, you know, who got a liquor license approved though, Speaking it's worth, of which. It's worth saying that uh, Fairfest did get a liquor license approved so they can sell adult beverages, as I like to call them. Mm -hmm. um, to adults. The, to adults. So that'll be an extra feature this year that wasn't there last year. All right. Uh, and by the way, we're very excited about that. That's uh, Tammy Jones and the good folks at KMCD Classic 96 that are taking that uh, volunteer chip on with a ton of people. We dropped by Pat Doyle's and his daughter's helping organize the mm -hmm. the team there, and it's going to be a, a nice feature. They're also organizing the stage. There's going to be two stages this year, one on the town square Saturday and Sunday, noon to four, while the Sondheim Center's going on, and KMCD um, helming that part of it as well. Just another quick aside, made it to KTWA in Ottumwa to talk with their well, they used to say they were the only Spanish-speaking show in the state. Of course, now we've had a Spanish-speaking show here at Crew for seven or eight years. So uh, it was fun. I went with someone who actually spoke Spanish, so I didn't speak much. But great people. They're going to come up and help introduce Los Lobos and Charanga Tropical. And in future, do some work with them. A lot of fun. So nice to see these things rippling out. Yeah, more collaboration. So that's another radio and, station. And you know what? One of the first things they asked was, and is there going to be a beer tent? <laughs> so that's what I said last year. You know, you don't do an event like this and not kind of have it's that. It's true. It so. is. I mean, you know, and for those who are concerned if there'll be public drunkenness or brawling or any sort of uh, lewd behavior, uh, think back to the the beer garden of all beer gardens, uh, Ragbri 2013. I worked in there for most of the night. I know it was uh, sold a lot of a lot of drinks, and there were people who had been drinking early on in the day. Uh, so even with that level of rambunctiousness and that many people, the only arrests made that night were locals. Oh, interesting. Yeah. How about that? Like <laughs> those guys that are on the bikes, you know, they're burning off so much. I don't know if it even hits them. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but at any rate, we just figured it's part of par for course for something of this size. So it was interesting. Yeah. One of the first questions that came up in that context was, uh, and I know there's some special things planned, and even next year we're talking with some interesting sponsorship on that level. But um, So we do appreciate, and by the way, speaking of that, it is important to note that getting a, a liquor uh, exemption like this is not 
something that happens very often, and it's something the city's been very careful with, and there are many steps you go through, and so that's this is the culminating part of that. So. Yeah, yeah, and the council almost unanimously supported this one. <laughs> one, one apologetically couldn't do it because of yeah. where he stands most of the time. And that's fine. You know, that's 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 why we have seven members to have diverse. Uh, Diverse representation. By the way, as you go into your next point, I just want to mention, obviously, our television viewers don't need this, but for our radio listeners, Michael has a very sharp little city of Fairfield uh, <laughs> ensemble there. Uh, looks quite nice. Yeah, it's a hand-me-down from my big brother, Kevin. Who <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. City clerk gave it to me. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, it's a polo shirt with the city of Fairfield. Um, Navy. Yeah, right there on the on the well, over the heart. There you, know, you go, really where it belongs. The so. heart of the heartland. So, yeah. what what else you got there? All right. Well, this is a, a review of our June ninth regular city council meeting. Uh, as I mentioned, prove that that liquor license, among other rather boring things. But we did a one appearance, and it was very cool. Um, Jerry Yellen, ah. World War II vet, fantastic, um, decorated pilot who just turned ninety recently. Uh, came to present a flag that he had received from the state of Texas that flew this flag in his honor over their state capitol. And he wanted to bestow this flag, American flag, to the city of Fairfield. So he handed that over, and uh, I think our uh, fire chief, Scott Vaughn, wants to hang it or, or fly it either regularly or just for city or for special occasions. So that was very touching. Um, so Mr. Yellen is also working, this is kind of an aside, but he did talk about it a little bit about, he speaks out a lot um, about the need for PSTD, post-traumatic stress disorder treatment for vets. Um, I don't want to go into it too much, but a lot of people who serve in, in combat can come back changed and uh, carry wounds that if not treated, they'll have for the rest of their life that basically can keep them from enjoying their their peacetime life and you know to think that somebody would would go and serve their country and not lose their life but then lose their quality of life it's it's equally tragic in a sense to to a death so there's a lot more attention on this now um it's actually got a name before they used to call it shell shock and all these these slang terms but no one really understood it but uh from my understanding basically in combat people get into um, kind of a, a hypersensitivity mode where they're always looking for potential uh, danger. And so they're, they're amped up that way. And that would make sense if you're being shot at or bombed or whatnot. And then that condition can last and, and stay with them. And they never fully relax. And that starts to damage the body and damage relationships and such. So it's great work that, that Mr. Yellen is doing. He says, uh, his goal is to be the last man standing, the last World War II vet. Uh, He's very competitive, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he as, as is his son, who is a wonderful tennis player. Yeah, so uh, and, and teaches sports and mental acuity with uh, former with Buddy Bianca Bianca Langana. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, former I do, uh, like the sports performance. Yep. Yeah, yeah, with uh, a major league baseball player of yeah. of no small uh, shape and so, form. But also, I wanted to mention. You you bring up a really good point. War used to be more that there was a front, and then you'd go to the rear. And you'd, uh, in these types of conflicts that we're seeing in the last decades, you never know if uh, a roadside here or somebody there. Or what, it's, so it's a whole different kind of psychology mm. in that kind of environment in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places, which is an issue. But also we're losing more uh, soldiers to suicide than we are to actual combat. So all these things do play and it's an important part of serving and then yeah. continuing to to uh, ha have that legacy it's an important part of it he's also written about japan mm -hmm. and and bringing these cultures together with his family very uh, in, engaging and uh, uh, a lot of stories to tell but yeah. in, in the best sense of uh, after being in war how to you know come around that yep. he's been in here several times for interviews a yeah. great guy i know the story he, he felt that he hated he he bombed Japan. That was what his his duty was in the war, and and he felt like he hated the Japanese. They were his enemy. And then over time, uh, he visited Japan post war, and one of his his other sons married a Japanese woman, and so then 
in a sense, had this this uh, need to integrate, and in a sense, uh, after time, fell in love with the Japanese culture. So uh, I forget the name of the book that he wrote. I do too, but it's it's wonderful. And yeah, it's, it, he's just a great storyteller, and you, how how personally engaging he is too. Yeah, yeah. So but that's fantastic. I just want to we we got a little bit off the track donating a, an incredible flag that flew uh, in Texas to the city. And now it looks like the police chief's going to uh, fire, fire chief. Fire chief's going to yep. take that. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, chief Harvey accepted on behalf of the city, and and it'll go to the fire chief. I Great. think they have a nice flagpole. We actually did a nine eleven memorial area in front of the uh, the fire station. Um, I suppose that was twenty thirteen. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was twenty twelve. Um, it's got a little bench and a bell and a little little tree and some landscaping. We put that there and right by the flagpole. That was a fun volunteer effort that that uh, a lot of people pitched in on, myself included. Dug the hole for the tree and the soil there is very poor. It was a it was a labor of love. So if you drive by and you see that little area, just know that uh, it's a 9/11 commemorative place just for contemplation and um, and it was put together by volunteers and and donated materials. Great. All right, so. One exciting thing that I was relieved is that the Fairfield Urban Tree Plan is finished. This is something I've been working with the urban tree manager for the DNR, Emma Hannigan. She uh, works up in Des Moines, working for quite a while, since last year, on getting this finalized. So it does include the new city tree ordinance and all the tree protection clauses that we put in there. And uh, some of the the plans for how we're handling the EAB, Emerald Ash Borer Infestation, and uh, just everything, any good action is better when you have a plan. Everyone, you know, you have a plan and you have something to go on. Now, obviously, it's like the Go Green plan. You don't just stick with what the plan says. Often things change as you go, but this had some very, a uh, couple key points I want to mention, some very in interesting and valuable uh, data. One is that just the, the street trees and sitting in the city of Fairfield, the DNR did an inventory of all our street trees. And uh, based on these calculations of the value that a tree provides in terms of energy savings through shade and uh, wind blocks, the uh, stormwater uptake, I should say, or management, aesthetic quality, air, air purification, home value increase, um, increase that's not an increasing home values we'll put it that way and uh and actually quality of life and lowering crime rate is something that's like a psychological aspect of urban trees that, well trees are the original stand your ground uh okay I'll yeah no oh, oh, yeah so the value of <laughs> city of fairfield's urban trees was put at over two hundred fifty thousand dollars wow a year uh and i thought that was really interesting to think that you know they might cost fifty dollars to put a new one in, depending if we get a grant, then it costs the city close to nothing. Volunteer labor plants it, but that these biological machines provide these services and they do it in a way that is passive. Uh, there's no input. We don't need to plug them in, or you know, we we can trim them and mulch them and and such. But they're very self-sufficient, and uh, I just like to to put the numbers behind that. So two hundred fifty thousand dollars per year and that's just the street trees in the city of fairfield um in terms of the services they provide and i don't think you can build a machine that would provide those services nature is taking care of it for us so there's that uh, uh kind of going along with that was a new policy for the parks department and the street department anytime there's a tree removal tree removal project of $2,500 estimated cost or more, we're going to competitive, put that up for competitive bidding. This is something that we're not obligated to do. State laws for competitive bidding only require it when it's over, I think maybe 40,000, you know, getting up into something that would be considered more substantial. But for these small things, we can just pick and choose. But for the sake of fairness, there are three certified arborists in town, arborist companies, and making sure the city gets the best price, competitive bidding is is advantageous for both of those. 
So moving forward, we'll have sealed bids where I don't know what you're bidding and you don't know what I'm bidding. And then they're open at the same time. And uh, as long as they have their insurance lined up and all, the uh, low bid wins. So that's good for everyone. Because a little competition in life is a good thing, I believe. Competition is for the competent, I've heard it said. Speaking of which and non sequiturs. Uh, you're listening to Solar Powered Crew FM. This is City Business with 4th Council Ward City Council Person Michael Halley. I'm James Moore, and this is also streaming online at KRUUFM.com. And uh, also shout out to all the viewers on uh, FMC. Uh, we come at you, well, no, we come with you. No, we present this information uh, <laughs> after each city council meeting the following Tuesday lunchtime. Thursday, then it rebroadcasts uh, dinner time, and the following Monday at breakfast time. Michael, what else we got? Well, we finally got the amended law center operations 2080 agreement. That's basically 2080 agreements are between various municip municipalities. So this one's between the city of Fairfield and Jefferson County. They own the law center. It's the Jefferson County Law Center. The city leases about half of it for our police department. So we had just tried to make uh, sharing of certain expenses more equitable. It was, in the past, working in the city's favor, paying 33% instead of 50% of things that we actually use half of. So we went in and, and made that right. Just fair is fair. We should pay our way. Pay our own way. So that was accepted. Uh, our city attorney spoke about selling Logan Apartments. Now, Logan Apartments... I don't know the history of why the city was ever involved in owning an apartment complex. It's not really something a city generally does, owning rental, but it was kept as uh, they call uh, Section 8 or HUD or subsidized housing. So it did provide a place for people who were on low income or fixed income or disabled or whatever who could get that government assistance could then... Uh, have some help towards the rent and it's a nice nice facility it's been kept up nicely uh if anyone knows what i'm talking about it's the corner of madison and fourth street that large apartment complex there uh it turns turns out the city could use the cash more than the property at this point and uh, after years of really deliberating the council decided that we would go ahead and sell it we had a uh, a period of time where people could submit bids, but we didn't receive any official bids. So we're, we still have some interested parties. So we're talking about how to put it back out for bid, maybe advertise in a larger area for people, even in other states that border Iowa, who basically companies that invest in these kind of properties, just to stir up a little more interest. But we're hoping to get a good bid. We did, by law, uh, create a situation we we can only sell it at market value so we can't sell it for some rock bottom price and that's in our best interest anyway it's not worth selling below market value market value being uh, standard appraisal but there is a stipulation that it needs to remain HUD housing that's right, right. so the stipulation is that it has to remain uh, HUD section 8 all, all the uh, the parameters that have been in place must stay that way I'm not sure. I don't think it can say indefinitely, but there's a, certainly a period of time so that tenants don't feel that they would then lose that ability to have um, subsidized uh, housing payments. So everything would stay the same for them, just different ownership. So that would be uh, kind of set their minds at ease. Still, there are some tenants who don't want to see it sell. They feel safer in a sense with the city owning it than a private investor I suppose that's one of those things, you know, you, people feel they have a voice in government, but maybe less so in a, if a private company were to purchase it. Maybe so. Change is always tricky anyway. If yeah. you're used to something, I think, in general, I, that's not to criticize any point of view. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll see. I'll, I'll update later on that one. Uh, let's see. The Public Safety and Transportation Committee met. Um, one thing that came out of it was our chief of police requested to have an official filming permit policy <clears throat> in place. She has had uh, some trouble in the past where uh, student groups, they could be Fairfield High School, could be MUM, could be private, uh, want to film and need 
essentially police assistance and closing off a street or uh, managing people or whatnot and didn't really give prior warning. And so she has, she has a limited budget for overtime and she's had to dip into that at various points to support somebody filming something. And so that's not in a sense fair to this, the police not to have a heads up. So this policy would just basically give anybody who wants to film and fills it out. And then now the police department or any other street department, parks and rec, you know, there are many departments that might be in play, uh, would know what's happening, where it's happening, what it's going to involve. There was a, a movie the mayor actually starred in yep, that involved shooting blanks downtown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, it was, it was all right, but, uh, that's something you, you want to let the neighbors know what's going on before you run down the alley. Yeah, these days for sure. Firing blanks. <clears throat> uh, so street closures, that kind of thing. But is this mainly for street closures? <laughs> it, it wouldn't have to do with uh, if you're shooting inside a facility or... Oh, no. If it's, if it's private and it doesn't involve needing city crews help, you just that's fine. This is okay. something that was specifically... So the, the film folks requested uh, requested block. you know I need the street closed or uh, can we have a squad car in the scene or I see. can we film in a city park those kind of things gotcha that's it's only if requesting assistance from the city gotcha so and what's, of, what's the process there well we had a policy that uh, chief had pulled online from online and was proposed um, Councilman Revolinsky asked that some of the people who are involved with the the filming department at MUM and FHS or anywhere else get a chance to chime in on it so that it's more uh, kind of balanced. And uh, we all agreed that that would be good. So it's it's been tabled until a meeting can take place of just to hammer out how it would be handled. Just we don't want to make something unnecessarily cumbersome. Don't want to put in more roadblocks. There's going to be a lot of local filming going on. Especially with Are the, you uh, saying you don't want to put in roadblocks for roadblocks? <laughs> Sorry. Exactly. Oh, man, I'm on fire. You really are. Um, Good thing it's raining. Economic Development Committee met. We yes. don't meet very much, but it was good to meet. It was nice to, to talk about something. Housing needs assessment. We're talking about putting together a housing task force yep. that mayor's putting together. Big deal. Yeah. We need more housing. Apparently, I just found out this is interesting. Right now, today, Tuesday, June 10th. There's a conference going on in Mount Pleasant with some kind of state big shots about this very issue. So Fairfield is not the only Southeast Iowa city to feel a pinch in the housing area. Apparently it's a problem across the state. So we're, uh, it's all about incentivizing. How do you get somebody to build in the city limits as opposed to out in the county? How do you get somebody to build a whole development you know, you don't want to sprawl, but you want to fulfill the needs of the people who live in your community. And there are needs that are not are not being met. There are people who work here who want to live in Fairfield who just can't find housing. It's kind of a good problem to have, I suppose, but I'd rather not have it. I'd well, rather... I mean, one, one of the, our, the macroeconomic issues is that people aren't building very much because it's hard to spend that much. And there's, oh, yeah. so it's a weird thing to get over that hump to have something for somebody is it's a hard thing you just don't see i went through some little city i think it was eldon we stopped to see the eldon pie lady she wasn't there but there was a little structure being built it was like oh yeah wood build mm -hmm. you just don't see that yeah, much. yeah not as much the economy has not supported private individual housing as much but in terms of development i like this idea of the small house a development of small homes so we're looking into the current city ordinance as a minimum size for do, you mean, do you mean tiny homes Those, yes okay yes and so changing those ordinances so that they would allow for this, maybe not anywhere, but at least in a development that if people chose to have tiny homes. The only stipulation maybe is that the development has a, a community center where there's a basement for emergency situations right. or something just to, to have a safety, uh, safety um, backup in case of bad weather. But more on that later. It's just the beginning phase of that one. Yeah, by the way, we're down to about three or four minutes with all these I know, I'm gonna get it. You, accoutrements you here. You always like, get right when I'm about to talk, but I appreciate it. All right, so I gave an update on the 175th anniversary of our fair city. That's this year. And I, I, just, I was showing, I just thought I'd show because the camera's here, some of the products that we're selling to, uh, to afford the $5,000 
firework order we already placed. You know, sometimes the deadline comes and you have to make an executive decision. We said, all right, we're buying the fireworks, then we'll raise the money to pay for them one way or another. So these commemorative Crocs are available at City Hall for $25. This, now... I'm not saying anything about Croc. Go ahead. Nope, I'm not going to do it. What a Croc? Come on. It, it is. What a Croc. You smell that? Mmm. It smells... Can you smell that over the radio? I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, it but... smells like... Can you smell that? It's like vanilla. Radio hazel, is the theater of the imagination. Trailing. All right, so... See what I mean? We've got these scented candles, and then, you know, this engraved... Look at that. Engraved... It's beautiful. We I'm are saying look at that to, to James, by the way, not to the listeners. But it's the guy <laughs> driving down the street going, why, you little... It's a, it's a laser engraved wood uh, lid to this. So it's once beautiful. you burn the candle down, you've got this incredible keepsake to always remember Fairfield's 175th. Till the next one. Who would ever want to forget? It's fantastic, actually. Do we have these t-shirts here? These are only $15. Again, we are Fairfield... Yeah. Making the world a better place since 1839. Uh, it was a good year. Yeah, 1839. So uh, we're also raffling off a commemorative quilt. Nice. Raffle tickets. I'm a big quilt fan. So we're these are our fundraising efforts to, uh, to pay for those fireworks. I can talk more about the festivities since I'm running out of time. But yep. July 4th, Art Walk Night. July 5th, Farmer's Market. Then in the afternoon, starting at 4, Waterworks Park. Vendors, dancers, live entertainment. July 5th, Saturday, that evening, the big fireworks show. It's going to be Sweet. bigger than it's been in the past. Way bigger than a bread basket. Yes. Fantastic. And then the next day, Sunday, car show downtown with more live music. Excellent. So that's the weekend as it's uh, coming together. You know, June is busting out all over. Vintage Power Wagon, Peter Coyote out here for that. We've got All Things Italian coming up. Uh, I think it's actually going to not get rained out. Well, I don't know. Right now, so as we right speak. now it says zero percent chance of rain for Saturday. Oh, good. Then it'll rain on Sunday, but that would be great. It's been rained out a couple years in a row, so it would well, be it, really it, wonderful. It's, if it did can, not. it's cannolis up the wazuli, and our good friend Dick <laughs> DeAngelis, of course, all things can you say Italian. That? I think so. Uh, <laughs> Authentic Italian food, music, art, and games, street performers, opera singers, madanari, chalk artists, jugglers, acrobats, roving musicians, and more. All Things Italian Festival. Uh, you can go on Facebook and find out more. There is a rain location at the Arts and Convention Center. We're not going to need it. But I don't think we're going to need it. Um, although last year was pretty fun when that rain was going sideways. <laughs> and also, don't forget, Fairfest is coming up. We got oh, what's that? 40, 45, 50 musicians, uh, different acts coming through. A lot of great stuff. You have to, you know, there's after parties. There's a whole bunch of stuff. So, you know, pace yourself. Yep. But this is the time of the year where you want to be almost too wasted to help tear down the stage Sunday night and Monday morning. Volunteers, are you listening? We need volunteers, okay? And almost by the way, wasted, your fundraising yeah. efforts, we're going to hire you next time. <laughs> yeah, right. Speaking of <laughs> spending and then getting. Anyway, this is James Moore <laughs> with Michael Halley. You've been listening to City Business. Thank you, FMC, for dropping by. We're going to go out with our Suerte Pastique Siesta Ocho. This goes out to Carmen Pratt and the good folks at KTWA. Coming up. In a few weeks, not even a few weeks, Los Lobos and Charanga Tropical. Mm -hmm.